All right, Psalm 45 could be titled, A Love Song to the Divine King. It's a psalm celebrating the wedding of a mighty king. This psalm has a dual meaning. Not only is it speaking of an unnamed earthly king of Israel, but it's also profoundly messianic, speaking of Jesus, our spiritual, our eternal king. The psalm begins with this lavish praise to the royal groom for all his splendor, his majesty, and his righteousness. And then this is followed in in verse 10 with counsel given to the bride before she was brought to the king's palace in all her glory. The psalm concludes with a proclamation of eternal remembrance of the king's name. It says, For the choir director, according to the Shoshanim, a masculine of the sons of Korah, a song of love. Verse 1. My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and your majesty, and in your majesty ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp. The peoples fall under you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. So we see God's blessing, God's favor, and God's grace poured upon this king. This king rides in victory for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. His enemies fall under his feet. He continues in verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloe and cassia. Out of ivory places, stringed instruments have made you glad. King's daughters are among your noble ladies. At your right hand stands the queen of gold in Ophir. Well, verses 6 and, verses six and 7 are quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where the author of Hebrews says that this is speaking of Christ. So not only do we see the earthly king as the groom, but the heavenly king, Jesus Christ, is the groom as well. He continues, now the psalm speaks to the bride of the king in verse 10. He says, listen, O daughter, give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people and your, daughters and your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Bow down to him. The daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is interwoven with gold. She has been led to the king in embroidered work. The virgins, her companions who follow her, will be brought to you. They will be led forth with gladness and rejoicing. They will enter the king's palace. In place of your fathers will will be your sons. You shall make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the people will give you thanks forever and ever. Well, we don't know exactly who the bride of this earthly king was, but we do know who the bride of Christ is, and that's the church. That's us. We are his bride. You know, over the years, our traditions of marriage have changed a lot. In biblical times, it was different. Instead of an engagement period, there was a betrothal. And the first step of the betrothal was the selection of the bride. And unlike today, most marriages were arranged by the fathers, by the families. So who chose the bride of Christ? Well, why don't you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. It's back in the New Testament, right? First and Second Corinthians. Galatians and Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So we were chosen by God to be the bride of his son before the foundation of the world. Talk about prearranged, man. Well, the second part of the betrothal was the payment of the dowry. And, and another thing to point out is, is once, once betrothed, they were legally bound together. It would take a divorce to separate them. Kind of different than our engagement. So what about our dowry? Well, if you turn forward just a little bit to 1 Corinthians, from Ephesians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. He says, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So we've been bought with a price. Now turn back to 1 Peter. It's right after Hebrews, towards the back, and James. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Peter 1, 17 says, If you address as father the one who, is in, who impartially judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a, as a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So we have been bought with a price. We have been purchased with the blood of Christ. The dowry has been paid. Now once the dowry was paid, the groom would return to his father's house to make room for his bride. He would literally add on to his father's house. Well, we see Jesus tells us in John 14, now turn forward to John. I'm going to wear out these Bibles this morning. John 14, 1, Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus has gone to prepare a place for his bride, for us. Now when the place was prepared and the groom was ready, he would return and receive his bride in marriage. And now I see this in 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians. And after Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, chapter 15, verse 51, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, Behold, I tell you in a mystery, we will not all sleep or die, that means die, we will not all die physically. But we will all be, we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable and the mortal must put on immortality. But when the perishable will have put on the imperishable and the mortal will have, mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So the groom is coming back for his bride. And then the church in Christ will be married. In Revelation 19.7, all the way at the back, tells us about this. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. He was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we, the church, are betrothed to Christ, right? Well, what are we supposed to do with that? Well, we should be preparing for our groom. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, turn, turn forward, 2 Corinthians, Chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians eleven two, 2. Paul says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity of, and purity of devotion to Christ. And Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 19, turn forward a little bit again, beginning of the New Testament. Matthew 19, 5. Jesus says, And said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So in the human marriage, there's, um, there's this leaving of the parents and a cleaving to the spouse. Well, spiritually, in our marriage to Christ, there's a leaving of this world and a cleaving to the kingdom of heaven. Well, are we doing that? Are we cleaving to the Lord's kingdom? Now let's turn. This will be one of our last. Uh, go to Ephesians. So we're going to be in here for a minute. Chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Paul tells us here in Ephesians about both marriages, about earthly and spiritual marriages. And we're going to focus on our marriage to Christ as we read this. But if the Lord speaks to you about your earthly marriage, that you know, listen to him, right? So Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. He says, "Wives, and remember, think about us, we're the wife of Christ." He's our husband. He's the groom or the, or the wife. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so, awful, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So are we subject to Christ in everything? Well, what does that mean? That means whenever there are two choices, my way or God's way, we need to do it God's way, period. And just ask him, Lord, especially this time of year, Lord, should I eat that second piece of cake? You know, Lord, do you want me to talk bad about that other person? Lord, do you want me to look at that person lustfully? Lord, do you want me to watch another hour of television today? 
Lord, do you want me to drink another beer? Do we have to wait for these answers? We know, we know these. Well, how about these? Lord, do you want me to talk to you more? Lord, do you want me to read your word today? Lord, do you want me to encourage my brothers and sisters in you? Lord, do you want me to love the lost like you do? Lord, do you want me to trust you completely? Lord, do you want me to live like you? Those are all yes, right? Those are obvious. We've got to ask ourselves these things. We have decisions all day long. Every moment we're doing something. Ask yourself, is this what I want to do or is this what the Lord wants to do? Are we subject, are we submissive to our spiritual husband? Are we doing things his way or our way? Well, with most of us, it's probably a mix of the two. But his command is in everything. Well, he continues in verse 25 of Ephesians 5. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless. Jesus gave himself up for us. He paid the dowry with his blood. He washed us clean. He lived his life completely other-centered. His full attention was on everyone except for himself. He was the complete and total opposite of selfish. He loved. He loved us. He loved everyone. He continues in verse 28. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one who no for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So we have been joined to Christ. We are one. His Holy Spirit is in us. Let me encourage you to continue to live for him. Not just this Christmas week, but always. You know, this is such a simple idea, but it can be so hard sometimes. There are always two choices. There's what our flesh wants to do and what he wants us to do. And the flesh can be so strong, can it? But he has already been victorious over the flesh. He has given us victory over the flesh. As Jill, my wife, would say, you just have to claim the victory. It's already done. Just claim it. Live for him. Be subject to him. Submit to him. All right, let's go back to Psalms. We'll look at chat. We'll look at Psalm 46 now. Psalm 46 uh, could be called a song of refuge in God. This was set to be done in a specific way. It was set to the Alamoth. Well, we're not sure what the Alamoth is, but we knew do, we do know that it was it was set in a different way than the other Psalms. So we can conclude that God likes to be praised in different styles or different ways. The superscription says, For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah said to the Olamoth, a psalm. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains should slip into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah. So where do we find safety and protection? God gives us refuge in Him. Notice, He doesn't take us off the battlefield. He is our refuge right on the battlefield. When trouble increases, you know, we have a tendency to run in every direction looking for help. When the fact is, God is a very present help. He is right there with us in times of trouble. The psalmist says, we will not fear even though everything's falling apart. Things can fall apart really fast, can't they? But God says he is a very present help in times of trouble. He is the perfect husband. And where is the perfect husband going to be in times of trouble? He'll be right there with you for protection, for, for, for safety. He'll have all the answers. He'll be right there with you. He is our refuge and strength right where we are. Well, how do I get that strength? If he's right there with me, how do I get it? How do we, how do we rely on that strength? Well, we've got to talk to him. And we've got to allow him to talk to us. Well, how do we do that? You know, I was talking about this with Jill a couple of weeks ago. How does God speak to us? Well, there are a few different ways that God speaks to us. You know, first we have his, his written word. And God will often use his word to speak to us. You know, uh, many, many of us this week, because of Christmas, we'll be assembling some kind of product because of Christmas furniture or a toy, a bicycle or something. And uh, so often, many of us will go ahead and do it without the instructions. You know, we'll start putting it together and, and uh, you get to the end and it doesn't quite work right or, you know, you got extra pieces, something, something's wrong there. And so you got to go back to the instructions, right? And you start reading the instructions and the instructions tell you what you missed. They show you uh, where you went wrong. Well, this book, God's Word, is our instructions, our instructions for life. And uh, so, you know, let's say you're having problems, since we talked about marriage, let's say you're having problems with your marriage. Well, and you're praying, God, what am I supposed to do? I'm struggling in this marriage. Well, we just read God's instructions for marriage in Ephesians. And he, told, he tells us that wives are to be subject to their husbands, you know, respecting them. And husbands are to love their wives in the same way that Jesus loved the church. That's his instructions for marriage. It's pretty simple, right? But it's, it's not easy, is it? You know, uh, if both partners are doing that, man, your marriage is perfect. It's awesome. If neither partner is doing that and playing their role, you know, the marriage is in trouble. It's it's It's... It's, it's doomed. But you need to do your part. If one, do, if one person is doing their part, the marriage will stay together. And over time, you being faithful in your role, hopefully the Lord will speak to the other person. Now, there's, there's circumstances. I mean, sometimes the person just leaves or, or infidelity or whatever. It's not always. But the Lord has given us instructions for the marriage. And... Uh, and we have to be faithful to what God has told us to do. Not, not faithful to point out to the other person what God has called them to do, but faithful to do our part. And, uh, you know, when the wife respects the husband, it's so easy for him to love her. It just follows that. And when the husband, of course, loves the, loves the wife like Christ loves it's so easy for the wife to follow his lead. It's difficult when it's, the other person isn't doing that, but we're still called to do that. This command is not conditional. It's not, you know, if I, I'll do my part if they do their part. Well, nobody's going to do their part. So we have to do our part regardless of what the other person is doing. 
You know, that's hard. But that's an example. God speaks to us through his word. Just like that. Well, God also talks to us. You know, there's instances in Scripture when, when God does this audibly, you know, using sound waves that go through the air and vibrate our eardrums and transmit that signal to our brains. But most of the time, God doesn't speak that way to us. He speaks to us in, in spirit. God has never spoken to me audibly, but he speaks to me all the time in spirit. Well, what does that mean? How do we know, you know, it's him? Well, remember that we're physical, we're both physical and spiritual beings, right? When our physical body stops working, our spirit will separate from it. And it'll either go be with the Lord or it'll go to Hades right now. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, we're told. So there's no, spirits aren't hanging around, not man's spirits. You're one place or the other. But remember, God is spirit, and angels are spirit, and fallen angels are spirit. And uh, if you're saved, then God's spirit is in you. But there's also these angels, and these fallen angels are around. And, you know, we're told in the Bible that Satan goes forth to and fro on the earth, seeking who he can devour. And even Jesus was tempted by, by Satan when Satan spoke to him. So when we're spoken to in the spirit, it's, it's like having a thought. And uh, so when, when we have a thought, well, how do we determine where it came from? Did it come from us? Did it come from God? Did it come from one of these fallen angels? Are we being tempted? Well, to me, they, kind of, they, they sound the same. My thoughts sound the same. You know, some of you, maybe, maybe it's different. But what's different is the content of the thought. You know, just like when someone is describing someone else, and you say, oh, yeah, that, that sounds like something Lynn would say, or, you know, that sounds like something. It sounds just like what someone would say. Well, we have a thought, and it's something that God would say. You know, it's, it's not the sound of the thought, it's the content that tells us, you know, that's recognizable. We recognize the content of the thought. If it's something horrible, sin, you know, selfish, sinful, well, we know that didn't come from God. We know from his word that he's not that way. We know it either came from us or we're being tempted. It came from a fallen angel. And we need to take those thoughts captive, it's, the Bible tells us. Stop them right there in their tracks. Stop those thoughts. Just disregard it. Now, if it's something Christ-like, we know it's him, right? And we need to listen to it and we need to obey it. So we learn the kinds of things that God would say to us by listening and reading his word. We're told faith comes from hearing the word of God. So we have to give him the opportunity to speak. When praying, give some time to hear the Lord and listen. After praying, read his word. Give him the opportunity to speak. So often the Lord speaks to us through his written word. But we've got to give him the opportunity. You got to... After praying, you've got to give the opportunity to the Lord to speak to you. If you don't stop and listen, you're not going to hear it. All right, let's continue on in Psalm 46, 46 verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places, of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nation made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. And then in verse 8, Come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. See striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will exalt, I will be exalted in the earth. 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. This psalm just drives home the message that God is our refuge, our stronghold, our place of safety. Praise God that we don't have to strive in the flesh, although we try to so often. And why don't we have to strive in the flesh? Because there is a river of living water pouring the Holy Spirit into our souls, refreshing us, strengthening us, empowering us to live for Him. And what keeps us from getting blown away? God is in the midst of us. He's here. He says, cease striving and know that I am God. God has it under control. Be still and know that He is God. The same God that has put His Holy Spirit in you says that He will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. Our God is so powerful. Take refuge in Him. And now Psalm 47. It's a short one. For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Verse 1. Oh, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with a voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared. A great king over all the earth. He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us. The glory of Jacob whom he loves, Selah. God is the great king over all the earth. Does everyone believe that? Only the child of God does. huh? By faith we believe that God reigns over us. But everyone serves some kind of God. Someone or something rules over everyone. Their God might even be themselves, doing everything, living for themselves. But praise God that He is the King, that He is our King, and He loves us so much. Someday every knee will bow to Him. Every one of us is going to be in their knee to God. So why not now? Why not start now? Psalm continues in verse 5. God has ascended with a shout. The Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praise to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of God, the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Sing praises to God. Let's do that right now. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Lord, thank you for sending your son to be born and to die for us, to be betrothed to us. It paid our dowry, Lord. Help us, Father, to be be the, the wife of the Lord that you'd have us to be. Help us to be submissive to what you've called us to do, Lord, in everything, Lord, in every part. Help us daily to consider what you would have us to do and help us to do that. Help us to be strong. Help us to claim the victory. Lord, you have won. You have conquered for us over this flesh, this flesh that we struggle with. Help us to claim victory over that, Lord. Help us to live for you. Be with us this week as we go out. Lord, help us to be examples to those that don't know you. So many celebrate Christmas and don't even know why, Lord. Help us to show them why. Help us to to be you for them, Lord. Help us to introduce you to them and share you with them. That they would see you in our lives, Lord. That your light would shine through us. Watch over us this week as we travel. Keep us safe. Help us to be mindful of you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.